Hi everyone and welcome back on YouTube. Hi Ivan. Hi, how's it going? You? <laughs> and this is day two of the motion design live streams. Um, so if you want to watch what happened yesterday, we had five guests and everything is already published on the Adobe Creative Cloud channel. So we also invite you to subscribe to our channel to be notified when there will be a new stream uh, because there will be more and more live streams, you will see. Uh, so we hope you like it. Uh, if you like live streams, if you like uh, even, if you like the video, also don't forget to press the like <laughs> button. There is a like button on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, it looks like that. That's I think it. that's the <laughs> use case. If you like, you just, okay. Um, and um, yeah, so you can watch episode one from yesterday where you were sharing some techniques with uh, basic shapes to uh, emulate uh, that. I mean, yeah, like 2.5D. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and you want to, to continue? Yeah, this? so yeah. we'll be continuing talking a bit about flat design and about nice. animation. And today we'll be exploring some more advanced tools and techniques. So yesterday Ooh. we looked at color, we looked at shadow. Today we're going to be looking at motion and we're going to be looking at details. So uh, for those of you, I guess, not familiar with flat design, if you, you can always watch yesterday, but in brief, flat design is the design aesthetic that kind of eschews or moves away from using a lot of effects, about using a lot of blurs and gradients and strokes and that kind of thing. Uh, so we'll be using a lot of simple vector shapes, using shape layers, and uh, using using less to tell more. So that is, uh, that's the plan. And uh, <laughs> they say Sarah looks different today because we, we just had the Sarah lower third, so well, it's fixed now. <laughs> we have the right lower well, third. Well, I'll be honest, Thanks, that's an, I've been working out a lot, <laughs> and <laughs> just changes. And we have Laurent from France. Yeah, so where are you from, guys? So we have Michel from Sweden. Uh, we have people from India also, I see, uh, Italy. Uh, so it's great, yeah, it's a worldwide stream. Uh, we're very happy to be here and uh, to share some uh, knowledge around the motion design in After Effects. So do you want to start with uh, yeah. an animation you met? Yeah, so let's jump into it and look at some examples here. Um, so here we have this wonderful cityscape. We've got a little doggy on the, on the roof here. Ooh. And though there aren't a lot of objects that we're looking at, it tells us a complete idea about what's happening, how mm. we're moving. We give volume to these buildings with just one, yeah. one little piece. Two and rectangles. That's yeah, it. exactly. And there are certainly different layers of the rectangles, and that adds more of what we call mm. a parallax. So parallax is going to be one of the ideas that we talk about a lot today, that objects that are closer to the observer seem to be moving faster than those further away from the observer. So that is, that is the, that's basically what parallax means. So you can then combine these things with human expectations of motion and mm -hmm. depth and that will create a fuller scene for you. So while flat design is about making things flat, we can use these tropes to make them seem deep. So that's the first thing we're going to talk about. Uh, another way that we sort of use uh, this idea of depth and motion in relation to each other is to give a more complete idea, in this case, <laughs> about the shape of this wave. Uh, so this is something that I saw from a, a group uh, called We Think Thoughts, I think. They do excellent work. Thoughts. Okay. What that's... do they do? They do they are motion, motion graphics? They are yeah. motion designers okay. of, of an amazing caliber, and uh, definitely check their work out. But this idea here that we're showing the depth of this wave here yeah. by just having two layers that are moving slightly differently from each other. So it's not parallax in the same way the other one was, where two things are in constant motion. But this is showing depth and layering in that the two of them move in relation to each other. So always remember that one if you have one thing in motion, that's great. And if you want to explain more about it, just set a second thing in motion. And you're, you're saying something by the contrast between the two of them. And uh, by the way, we are live from San Francisco. So don't hesitate to use the chat to ask questions because mm. we have the chat in front of us. So we will pick all your questions and try to answer all of them. Answer them live. Yeah, <laughs> live. Uh, so yeah, it's a unique opportunity to uh, engage with uh, Evan. And um, uh, of course, he will uh, deconstruct all these examples, show you some tips and tricks. But yeah, 
Yeah. Feel free to ask any kind <laughs> of question, you know. Yeah, right now we're in the overview phase, then we're going to move into the doing stuff phase. It's just Evel asking how do you decide which uh, what colors to use. So. Oh, good. So uh, we were talking about this about, about this yesterday, that yeah. colors form another layer of information and language that we use to describe things, to convey emotions, to convey ideas. Uh, by choosing colors, uh, one thing that I didn't mention yesterday is that as a designer, you don't always have the option to choose your colors. Usually the client has chosen colors for you, but when you have the freedom to choose them, uh, I highly recommend starting with a central color that you know really speaks to you or really speaks to the work. So in this case, the dark blue of the ocean yeah. is what really drove that idea. In the cityscape, it's the yeah. purple of the dusk. And then all the other colors are derived sort of from there. So if you're familiar mm -hmm. with color theory, uh, there are a lot of different um, sort of ratios between color values that create these ideas. But thankfully, Adobe has a wonderful tool. You can just go here, window, pull up some extensions, and be yeah, yeah. get these color themes going. And the Adobe color themes, basically, it is it goes ahead and, and does all this hard work for you. Hmm. So, um, oh, I don't think this computer's Oh yeah, maybe I just need to connect it, so sorry. Which is a... Uh, it's still early. Here. There is still a, a website also. There is also a website, let me pull the link in mm -hmm. the, the chat. If you don't, if you want to check, you know, all these tools to uh, create a color palette, this is color.adobe.com, and mm -hmm. basically you have the same tools. And uh, you can play with uh, yeah. Yeah, so the, 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 the wheel, the yeah. wheel of color. And you can play around with it. You can save it. You can share your colors. A lot of the time, uh, what you'll be doing is you might be searching on there to see <laughs> colors and get inspiration from other people. Um, because though, though all of the ratios are great, uh, going outside of them and mixing them in different ways creates very interesting palettes. And I will say that. Uh, uh, Adobe Color, you've got uh, five swatches to work with. That's the maximum number of swatches you really want to be throwing into a project. Okay. You may use shades and tints of those, but try to keep it to five and under that that area, Great. just to make things very clean. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that helps uh, explain about the color. Yeah, and uh, Ahmed would like to know more about the repeater. So we talked about it yesterday, but if you have the opportunity just today to use mm -hmm. it again, maybe. Yeah, we might get into it a yeah. little bit more. Um, uh, but if not, definitely check out yesterday. Yeah, um, episode one on the Adobe Creative Cloud channel. Yeah, we went deep into the hierarchies of shape layers and all that great stuff. Um, but yeah, without further ado, what's the last example we're going to be doing? So, oh, yeah. so we talked about. Parallax showing how depth and how big how big things can be, mm -hmm. uh, but this is a smaller scale. This is sort of a macro, uh, you know, the macro micro thing. <laughs> so this is this is a small character. We'll talk a bit about character design too. That you know we know that he is turning from side to side because his eyes are changing size. Things are scaling. They're squishing to the one side of his head, and I mean, the, one of the big telling features is this wonderful hat he's wearing. That the contrast in the parts of the hat are telling us what is happening with this motion. So it's about harmonizing all of these elements to have a more consistent idea about what's going on. And we could strip away many of these things. We can take the hat away. We take the hat away. He's, you know, he's still telling that story. Yeah. We could, you know, we could take his arms away, which would be a little bit creepy and weird, but we could do it. So we take these arms, we take those away, and just his face is telling that story, which is another thing we should talk about with flat design is telling more with less. So if you can get away mm. with using fewer shapes and fewer things, then uh, we will uh, will want to do that. Um, and I know this is a question on there um, from uh, Devang. Uh, what about creating shadow? Uh, that's something we definitely got into yesterday in a in a yeah. big way. So I would recommend. Yeah, you covered at least uh, three techniques. Yeah, <laughs> to there create were the shadows. Many ways to get shadows, get those long shadows. So we might not dwell too much on it because today it's about highlights. We're gonna yeah. yeah we're gonna we're gonna get get brighter. Um, no shadows today. Everything's uh, bright and excellent, and uh, <laughs> have a good time. So, I'd like to start uh, by getting into the cityscape and sort of showing what's going on in here, and then we'll build it ourselves and follow along uh, at home. So, if we go in to what actually makes the cityscape kind of work, we've got 
this large moon, which is moving across, that's just a shape layer that's cutting a hole through a solid, and that is revealing. <laughs> okay. So it's so it's not a mask. No, we're just using, a hole. We, you... We're using a shape layer as the alpha inverted mask to cut a hole, and then through that we are observing the scene of buildings, which we've grouped together here into this uh, composition, and. You can see it a little better in here, what is actually going on with the buildings. That all of the, these buildings are just simple rectangles, and they're moving from side to side. They appear to be growing, which is, they're, they're growing along this wall here as mm -hmm. we see more of them. And we're really just using linear keyframes. <laughs> so if you're not familiar with uh, all the types of keyframes that there are, we've got linear ones, we've got eased ones, we've got roving ones. These are just linear, meaning that from their start to their end, we are in constant motion. Right? Same speed. Yeah, same speed all the time. But what's also super important is that all of the things that are happening in here, all of them have the same speed, or they all have the same linear uh, progression through their speed. So we could say if we took one of these and we eased them, like if we ease these uh, position keyframes, even on just the little uh, F9, there we go, uh, just on the doggy here, right in the center, by easing their keyframe, something strange kind of happens to them. They sort of get pushed out of being in the right spot. So it becomes confusing and because it's no longer congruent with the rest of the motion. Mm -hmm. So the important thing here is if you want to convey consistent motion, you have to be consistent in your keyframes, and you have to be very careful with those. Um, but if you make them all and you tweak them all at the same time in the graph editor, it'd be much easier. So the actual construction of this scene uh, is a bunch of buildings that are rectangles. We've got a few layers. So we've got uh, we've got one layer. We've got its highlights. We've got the second layer, and we've got its highlights. And that's enough for us to say, because we're comparing and contrasting between these two objects, uh, to move between them. So Laurent, Laurent is asking, like, why don't you use a camera? So you don't always need to use a camera is mm -hmm. what I'll say. And we certainly could have made these actual 3D layers, we could have actually separated oh, their depth, yeah, yeah. right? Extrude. Yep. So, well, we wouldn't even need to extrude them, right? We could uh, we could just have them all as flat layers, and then, oh. we, right? So mm. uh, imagine, imagine when you make layers 3D that you're creating these cardboard sort of cutouts. That's the mm -hmm. best way to think about it, unless you are using the ray trace and pushing it out. So we could make those that all those cardboard cutouts, and then we could move the camera from left to right over them. The reason I didn't do that is simply because this is way simpler to work with, and if I need to go in and I need to make some subtle changes to these things, if I say, oh, well, I, I don't want this building here, I want it over here, you know, I can just grab that building and I can move it without having to, in 3D, worry about, you know, now is it offset in a very different way from where it was before. Um, three, when we use a camera, we're usually trying to simulate something. And I said this yesterday, but we want to simplify and not simulate. Okay. Be just because the camera might make more sense to, and if it works for your workflow to have these 3D things and then move the camera yeah. through them, um, I would say go, go for it. But that's really only adding an extra layer of complexity that you might not even need. If we were going to throw in some particles, if we were mm. going to throw in some other 3D things in here, then definitely go for the camera because mm. the camera will afford you the ability to then do those things. But in a sort of flat scenario, we want to keep it flat. And the other thing that's, things can get confused with the camera and with 3D layers when we start getting into collapsing transformations down the road. So then we start to see things expand in strange yeah. ways. So it's all about control. You want to you want to know what's going to happen and you want things to be very versatile for you. So if you are moving in a 3D direction with your project and you know from the offset I want to do 3D things, I, I want to have I want to have things fly towards the camera perhaps in a realistic way, then 3D layers may be for you. Um, in this case we're gonna we're gonna not touch them at all. We're gonna make the illusion of uh, 3D. So 
Uh, hopefully that explains about cameras. Um, yep. And so back into this uh, example, we've got silhouettes that are moving only slightly differently than mm. their silhouettes. So we've got silhouettes and we've got highlights of those. Mm. And they're, they're just duplicates and they're just moving slightly. So let's reconstruct this scene from nothing. You know, how would we do this if we had to start from scratch? Okay. So we would make a new composition. Uh, we had questions yesterday about frame oh, yeah. rate. And you want to choose the frame rate that is appropriate for how you're going to export your project. Uh, since we are streaming on online here, we want to be at a nice 29.97, kind of similar to the frame rate that you're observing the humans on screen at. Um, your frame rate is going to really depend on where you're going with it after. But we've got this blank canvas, and we can just go in and we can just start making rectangles. Okay. Now, yesterday I poo pooed uh, <laughs> drawing rectangles and s squares and circles wherever you wish. That's because in that example we needed precision about where those things are. Mm -hmm. In this case, we're using the drawing tools much more similarly to how we would do it in Illustrator, for example. Mm -hmm. We are simply creating a large scene to work with, so we're not too concerned about precision, I'll say that much. Um, so we just want to create a skyline, sort of a rough idea. Here could be a building, and we want a variety of buildings. That's a building. You know, we'd probably want to keep these just a little bit smaller, because the more of these details you have, the more interesting it will appear visually. So if you can create a more varied uh, skyline, that'll help you out. But always keep in mind your framing and your final goal with these things. Uh, usually it helps to mock these things up in Illustrator and then come in here. And if you're building, say, a more advanced cityscape, maybe you specifically need the skyline of Seattle or you need the skyline oh, yeah. of New York. You're going to want to trace those elements, do something like that in uh, Illustrator, and then we can bring that in, convert it to shapes. So however you generate your skyline, uh, we are going to call this skyline one. We're going to end up with one layer that is our skyline. And we're going to need to choose a color for this. It doesn't need a stroke, so I'm just going to turn that off. Mm -hmm. And in our example, we wanted a very dark color. So let's actually work in reds today. Nice, uh, Some nice dark red here. Be a very ominous skyline, I suppose. So we've created one series of rectangles. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like a city yet. We're not it's just not happening. So we've got Skyline 1. Let's duplicate that and create Skyline 2. That's really good, really good names. And then we can just double click on these things and kind of move them around and create our second um, grouping of these things. And it's good to have both of them up while you're working on it. And you might want to change the colors of the layers here so that you're able to differentiate between the two of them when you're, when you're clicking on things. Um, so let's move this one a little bit, maybe make it a little wider building, like we so. We have the Brazilian community of motion design with us. <laughs> awesome. Hi, Brazil. There's amazing work coming out of uh, Brazil yeah. and South America. So yeah. that is... Uh, we you have a lot of viewers yeah. on our channel. Yeah, we, we have a lot of folks uh, from down there, and nice. uh, the work they're doing is terrific. So yeah. keep, up, keep up the good work. And, uh, and if you don't know Ivan's channel, the link to his channel is in the description of the video. <laughs> so yeah, make check sure it to out. check his tutorials. <laughs> you see Abrams on YouTube, you're going to love it. Um, <laughs> so we've got, uh, we've got two sort of separate and distinct uh, groupings of buildings, which we are going to use to sort of define the depth of this space. Okay. So starting out with the most basic of things, we're just going to call up the position by hitting P. We set keyframes for the position, and then we're going to move ahead into the future, to the end of this mm -hmm. composition, and we're going to move these. So maybe I'm just going to hold down Shift and hit the arrow key here, and that's going to bump this ahead uh, a bunch of spaces. We don't really need to go too far, uh, maybe maybe only this far. But the big thing we need to do is make sure that both of them are not moving the same distance, because okay. if that happens then it'll appear as if they're right on top of each other. But even now, we've only done a little bit of work, and we look at this, we can sort of infer from what we're looking at that these buildings, as they start to separate into these, they start to make these gaps, 
you might want to, if you're starting to see gaps that appear that look pleasing, then you can start to massage these to sort of accentuate some of these ideas. Um, so you'll want to probably play around with these things if you have that option. If you're working with a very specific kind of skyline elements, then maybe don't push them too much. But for a lot of folks, a skyline is determined by the largest buildings there. So uh, I'm from Canada. You can probably tell by my outrageous accent. So we have the Toronto skyline is dominated by the CN Tower. When you see that, you know it's Toronto. Okay. Every other building is kind of, who knows? Who knows what that is? Is that the TD building? I don't know. We know CN Tower. We know the Sky Dome, Rogers Center, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, where the Blue Jays play. Those two buildings would define that skyline. Everything else is rectangles. So if you're doing something uh, you need to do in New York, you need to do Paris, uh, then you've got the one yeah. main thing. There's always an iconic yeah. monument or building. Exactly. And everything else can kind of just be stuff. Because unless they're, they're like people are really into picking out the details, <laughs> then uh, and if you're really into picking out the details, definitely do that too. So we've sort of, we're telling this idea of things shifting away from each other at consistent speed. So if we want to add a second layer to this, we want to show that these buildings are deep. We're moving from, we're panning across them. So we want to say, how do we know this has depth? Well, we're going to duplicate, for example, Skyline 1, creating Skyline 3. But now the big change where we call it Highlight 1. And we want to put that behind Skyline 1. And we're going to change its color to be brighter. Depending on your color palette, that might mean a brighter color. For us, we are going to simply increase uh, some of these values here, and we're just going to mm. get just a nice, a nice brighter red out of it. So maybe this is a this is a sunset of some kind. And what we're going to do is we're just going to push this to the side, like so. So we're just holding down Shift, I'm hitting hitting over, and. You want to make sure you're doing that on the keyframes. It's really important yeah. to alter that keyframe. That now these, if we play that back, you can see it start to push out yeah. from the side. And it's creating that illusion. And it can be a little bit jarring, so you might want to actually start it with a little bit out there already. Mm -hmm. And we'll just repeat the process for Skyline 2. So we duplicate that layer. It's important to teach things twice in case people yeah. miss it the first time. <laughs> this project is almost ideally suited for teaching people. It's <laughs> almost like we planned it. So then we've got Skyline 2, Skyline 3. This is actually the Highlight 2. Highlights should go below the originals. They should have a bright color. So we can take this and we can just pick that color, keeping within that limited color palette. And now you kind of want to make a bit of a choice, we know that Skyline 2 is closer to us, so it should have more motion in its depth than the things that are away from us. Oh. So if it's beginning kind of like this, it has a, starts with an even smaller sliver, it should end with a much larger sliver. Because things that are closer to you display more motion than the things that are away from you. So then you end up with this kind of a look. And what may happen for you is that you need to sort of tweak these things to sort of get them into the right space for how they're going to work for you. Um, it's all down to the kind of look that you're creating. It's all down to um, the sort of scene that you're showing for yourself. Um, but one thing I'll definitely recommend is make sure that you color your layers I'm using these layer labels down here. When you're working with uh, when you're working with shape layers and you're working with a lot of shape layers, as happens in these kinds of projects, then things can get out of control really fast. Labeling is key, and making use of these colors is definitely very helpful to set up you set yourself up for future success. Because if you come back to this project later, um, then it could be uh, widely confusing. So now we've got these buildings. I think that, that's, that's looking pretty good. Um, one thing I'll say is that if you want individual buildings to appear wider, so you might be thinking, you know, this uh, 
this central building right here. This one should be a much wider building. I want it to appear as if, you know, this one is, is just a giant, uh, giant wedge. What you can do is you can go in and you can select uh, its specific rectangle, uh, which we've got it selected here. And do, do, do. we go into the contents. See, we've got a bunch of rectangles. So we've got that one, this one, these ones, and there it is. So rectangle one, we can then go into rectangle one and we can alter the transformation of rectangle one by altering its position. And since we want it to kind of stick out, we want a keyframe at the beginning and at the end for its position. And it'll just come out a bit more like that. So what we're, what we're doing is essentially making it move still linearly right but it is moving in a way that is describing much more depth to it um, so you can kind of see what the skyline's turning into there um, the next thing to do that we did with the project is to take these things and cover them up with our our big moon right and the trick of that was that the moon is actually not the thing we're looking at you're looking at a very bright background or taking everything else away. So this is a little play of positive and negative space for those who enjoy fine art. Uh, <laughs> that is, uh, that's how we talk about that. Um, without the positive space, there can be no negative space. Each informs the other. Um, uh, some, some people will tell you there's no such thing as negative space. It's a little art theory for you. There's just positive space and everything else, but the two terms are helpful. So we're gonna make a new solid Solids are unlike our, uh, our shape layers in that they don't have vector information in them, but they're still very useful because they render incredibly quickly um, and they're, uh, they're just great. So we're gonna bring the saturation down on this, um, brightness all the way up. This is the brightest moon of all time. And uh, we are creating just this giant background back here and now we need to create uh, basically the moon hole that's going to be in these things. So I would also like to make a new solid that is going to be, you know, the color of darkness that we've chosen for our limited color palette. So we're going to go with that deep red. And uh, then we need a giant circle for the moon, um, which uh, you could make a mask on this if you want. But I like the, uh, I like the control that comes with making a shape layer. I just double click up here. I hit U U yeah, for Uber unlink. frame. Unlink these things. Make this moon the size that your moon should be. Um, nice big one, just like that. Okay. And, and if you're in your painting, then uh, if you want the moon to be wherever you want, you just put it wherever you like. It's your thing. <laughs> it's a little Bob Ross reference for everybody. Okay. Yeah. So we have a we have a nice little painting of Bob Ross in the studio with us here. Uh, so, uh, so we'll call this the moon outline. Um, I like to make any time I'm using a mat, I want to make that fuchsia because it really stands out that that, okay. that that is so different from the other layers. Mm -hmm. um, and then we go into the, you might have to toggle your switches and modes to pull up the track mats and then you get the track mat of the deep red solid and then we go alpha inverted. And what that's saying is if you're not familiar with track mats out there, um, then these options are saying this layer looks to the layer above it mm -hmm. and says, hey, what are you doing? I'm going to do the same thing. So anywhere the layer above it has alpha information, then we're saying do the inverse of them. So be everywhere it is oh, not. I see. So uh, there are many options down here. You could say be everywhere it is. That would be the alpha mat. You could do a luma mat if you're doing a black and white kind of thing. Um, but alpha inverted is just fine for us. And then I'm going to go in here and I want this thing to move in a nice graceful arc. So what I think I'll do is I want to use its rotation for this actually. Um, mm. And so what I'll do here is I will take its anchor point, uh, just hit Y to call it this anchor point moving tool, move it way down, way down here. And then I'm hitting V so I can just move its position and move it up here. So this is kind of, that's kind of where the moon should probably be around there. And then I'm going to rotate along and it rotates along that anchor point. So. There are some Bob Ross fans in the chat. I see like <laughs> happy big moon. Yeah. Good. <laughs> so we're gonna rotate the moon around that axis 
So let's we could start it over here, and then uh, say 20 degrees is probably enough. And then over here we go negative 20 degrees. Oh, and it's kind of poking through the bottom down there. So you might have to resize your moon, which you can then do by just hitting UU, and whee, the moon gets a little bit smaller. Things get a little less magical. Uh, and that's uh, that's what you got. Hmm. So now it's tracking along. Now the other thing that we did in the example was we put a little character in here. We have all of these big, we have all these big shapes, these big very general shapes. And to put a little visual interest in there, just put a little thing. So we're think of it as a contrast. We have the contrast between the dark and the light. We have the contrast in here between, I guess, the mediums and the darks and the lights. So we're playing with that kind of contrast. Another type of contrast is between general and specific, or between large and small. Oh, okay. And so... So you want to catch the attention? That's right. And so just by... Let's pick this little building okay. right here. Because in the narrative of this, like if this were a scene that we wanted to put in something, this would be a way to sort of reveal a character. This is where Batman oh, would Batman. be, you know, the Batman. Let's would. put Batman. Oh yeah, well, I don't really want to draw Batman. I don't have a lot of time here. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna find out how. Let's put Paul. Okay. Put Paul okay. Paul. Good. <laughs> well, everybody knows that Paul looks like Batman. <laughs> if he ever wears a mask, you would swear that <laughs> he is eccentric billionaire. <laughs> All right. So, what we're gonna do is we're going to put a little thing out there, okay. and. Um, in our example, we, we just did a little dog, um, and so we'll we'll draw that again. I think this will be pretty easy. Um, uh, so the best way to do this, I find, is to just start just start drawing a little shape. Doo -doo -doo. This is what dogs look like. That's obviously a dog's body and a tail. Everyone knows this. Uh, I'm gonna solo it so I'm not confused. I'm not touching anything else, and. Uh, and we're just going to draw a little circle out here. Again, I'm treating this exactly like Illustrator, where I'm just drawing shapes, I'm moving them around, because I don't have any intention to animate these things yeah. later. If I did want to have its head go up and down, mm -hmm. I want to take special care to keep those parts separate, Yeah. right? So yeah, in this case, you won't edit like uh, rotation keyframes or... No, this is all... Not even position. Very basic. Maybe basic position. And uh, we're really just defining defining a nice little silhouette and as long as you're selecting the shape layer and you get the pen tool out it yeah. starts to make more shapes oh, inside the layer inside that layer keeping it all very organized okay. like we talked about so hierarchy of things is important labeling of things is important understanding where things are in your project very important so we've got you know this this is a nice a nice little dog and something else to consider when you're designing these things yeah. is that I'm going to scale this way down so I'm going to take its anchor point, I'm going to stick it, you know, on the bottom of it so it makes sense for me, and it's going to get scaled very, very tiny. So when you're drawing these things, you want to make sure that the details that you've put into it can be seen when it's very small. So, you know, we've used these sort of blobby, um, almost like a Memphis style of assembling this thing out of triangles. Um, for those who really enjoyed Save by the Bell, you'll be familiar with Memphis style from its titles. Um, but we've got this little doggy, and we are going to put him on the building, like so. And now we can even start to make choices about where is this dog on the roof? Is the dog closer to us? Is the dog far away? So we're going to take the dog. Because it's being lit in this way, the dog should probably have the same color as the building. And the building it's going to be on is part of Skyline 1. So let's just move it down and have them next to each other. And let's make our lives a little easier by parenting one to the other. And Okay, so when you do parenting like this, you share what? what they share the same properties? So when you parent things together, if you've ever seen uh, parents with their children at the mall, it's very important <laughs> that children stay with their parents at the mall. I, I got lost at the mall. It was traumatic for me, so this is why I remember it this way. That... The children must always follow their parents. Um, and so in this case, by parenting the doggy to Skyline 1, as Skyline 1 moves, the dog is stuck to it, and it must stay there. If we rotated Skyline 1, if we did this, then the dog stays 
there rotating with it. Hmm. So altering the layer properties of one layer directly correlates to this other one. In fact, its properties have now been fundamentally altered to be in reference to that first one. So if we take this parenting relationship away, notice its position uh, is 870, 4, 6, something, something. But when we parent it, we parent this to this, those numbers change. Um. And they're changing because its definition of itself is now in relation to its parents. Um, <laughs> so, do, I mean, it really depends on how your relationship with your parents is. If you define yourself uh, by them, some people do. Uh, certainly, uh, those things are uh, important to people. That's why we use the language here. So, uh, it's very similar in a bunch of other programs that you have this relationship. Sometimes they're called, uh, they call it something else. Sometimes it's called linkages. Sometimes it's called uh, parenting. Sometimes it's called slaving. So, one thing stuck onto another. And uh, since we've got it stuck on here, we know just from its basic movement like this, back and forth, that it must live on that building. In mm -hmm. fact, it must live on the very edge of that building because it's moving at the same rate of speed as that other thing. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to call up its position. We already did that. We're going to put a little keyframe here, and we're going to have it just move a little bit, mm -hmm. just a little bit so that we could say, the doggy is maybe in the middle of the roof. It's being very safe. I mean, if it is a superhero of some kind, maybe it is on the edge. I don't know. That's we'll ask Paul about what it's like to be a superhero later. <laughs> um, <laughs> that you're constantly on on edge. Um, but that's how we make that scene. Uh, and you'll want to sort of play around with. You can see how when this starts to appear out the side of that building, that's kind of. That's sort of like a moment for people to start paying attention to that slice. Ooh. So you'll want to set up these things for yourself uh, so that your subject, whatever it is, is being revealed in a, in a nice way. And so that's a little primer on parallax uh, right there. So um, I'm going to drink some water because I'm thirsty. And we'll see if there are any quandaries before we move on. That's very good. I know what we could do. Mm. We could do this, you know? Yes. Uh, so maybe if you can uh, show, because we have uh, not a contest, but just an opportunity for you to share your art and uh, the animations that you are building with After Effects, um, uh, I mean, following your tutorials, yep. you know, for instance, and all the advices from all the streamers. Just share it on Twitter, add the Adobe Live hashtag, and it will give you an opportunity to be reviewed by our, uh, not teachers, but our, how can I say that? I don't know, experts maybe? Experts, or yeah, it sounds, sounds guess fair. Experts. Sounds fair. <laughs> the geeks, <laughs> guess experts, yes, yeah, too guess. hard to pronounce for me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we wanted to showcase uh, three animations that have been shared yesterday, actually. Uh, the first one is by Illusiones de Antonio. And uh, yeah, you want to say something about yeah. this uh, little kid? So this is using a lot of the principles that we talked about yesterday. Yeah, we saw yesterday, yeah. And that we're going to talk about today. So uh, if you look here, you look at the kid, look real closely at what's going on down there uh, with his with his feet and the way things mm. are shortening down there as he swings towards us. Um, we were being told so much about you know how this kid is moving just by the squishing of those of those parts in relation to the other parts right and uh, i think that's a great a great use of uh, of the techniques um i mean if i had to leverage any criticisms i would say that uh, it would be nice to know why these leaves are plummeting from the tree <laughs> you know a little bit of motion up in the branches might have been nice but this really draws your attention to the to the kid yep. in there, right? So it's really the only thing moving, um, and these leaves also have a little. Uh, they're using a bit of that technique where bright leaves appear to be closer to us, dark oh. leaves appear to be further from us. Um, so uh, anything that's closer to the observer appears to be moving quicker and is brighter and in higher contrast. But things that are further away, less contrast, uh, slower motion. So we kind of have that going on in the leaves. So. There's a lot of depth going on here. There's a lot of interesting stuff, but it's told simply with, you know, very pleasing graphics. So, very good. 
You had something else by H. Varen, which is a, a farmer. Oh, like digging. Yep, farming. Farming, click, click, click. <laughs> so here we see some, some nice character animation in the arms there uh, as they, they move linked to each other. You know, it, oh, and yes. it's, it's telling us, again, another story about this character. And you have to make a, a lot of choices when you're making characters, which we will do coming up soon. Um, you have to make a lot of choices about, you know, who they are, what do they mean in this context, um, whenever you make any characters, but very much so in animation because you have 100% control over everything you're making. You start with nothing and then you make something. So everything that you put in there is, it's on you to make choices um, about uh, these ideas. Yeah. Um, I remember it, rem it reminded me of this game. Oh, <laughs> and like it's another world. Yeah, that was characters are a little bit like this. And so then we have this by Yorgos. Mm. The Adobe Live animated logo. Yep. And this is great because we have a, a good variety in the type of motion that's going on. Mm -hmm. um, it plays very well with the format. Um, we've seen actually a lot of people yeah. exporting things in a square format these days because yeah. that's how Instagram and Twitter and it's very optimized for a mobile experience. So although you'll see me working in the more traditional 1920 by 1080, that's 16 by 9 format, uh, creating things for a square frame is becoming very popular and I think oh. It has great symmetry. I love things that are symmetrical. Uh, that's a little OCD uh, <laughs> for you. But I think this is really good. It's it's showing a stretch and bounce in things. It's uh, all the letters come on in a unique way. Yeah. And then it, it leaves differently than it arrives. And if you watch episode one, which is available on the Creative Cloud channel, you will. Uh, it's very similar to the, the watch, the clock mm. uh, sample you were building mm -hmm. you know, with the two circles and the shadow. So it's good, Yorgos. I mean, you, you can feel that he has been directly inspired by uh, yesterday's yep. tutorial. So uh, we will give away one Creative Cloud subscription to your favorite uh, animation. So is it the little kid? Is it the farmer? Or is it uh, the animated logo? And uh, to do so, I will just put a link in the chat. OK, vote for your favorite English way animation. Okay. <laughs> here we go. Oh. What? What? The technical difficulties. Why? Oh, okay. No, no, okay. So I will find a way to, mm. to put it there. If you can just uh, switch to another view, I will put it now. So yeah, uh, so those were things that were made for yesterday's oh, I know uh, stream. But after today's, uh, definitely also uh, use the hashtag Show us more stuff. Uh, we we want to see what you guys are making with the stuff uh, that we're doing. And make sure you use that hashtag Adobe Live when you share it with us. Yes. It's very important. So I will put the link now. I think I know why. And vote. OK. There we go. Now you have the link. Bravo. And uh, I will just review the, the vote in five minutes and announce the winner. Perfect. Okay. And stay with us because also at some point during this stream, we will give away a one year credit card subscriptions to someone in the chat. Mm -hmm. Which is, is pretty life changing for people who are just yeah. starting out in uh, graphic it's design. It's a good way to start so with all the creative apps yeah. Photoshop, Illustrator, mm -hmm. After Effects, Premiere Pro. And you can jump in, you can start training 12 hours, 16 hours <laughs> every day, and uh, you'll be good to go. And make a difference. Absolutely. Okay, so you wanted to show another yeah. example. So the next thing that I think we should jump into is we should talk more maybe about these beach waves because we were using linear motion to show these things before. Uh, let's talk about showing nonlinear motion as we were showing not a parallax motion, but of the idea of waves sort of rolling over each other or catching up to each other, which is showing detail in the character of how things are moving. And thankfully, we don't have a lot of keyframes to talk about, just a few, just a few of them to go through. Um, but let's build these waves. As you can see by looking at this, there are, it's not a huge number of things in this scene. It's a bunch of solids and it's a couple of shape layers. We're going to be using techniques to make these waves that we also used yesterday with Boolean operations using those merge paths. So let's uh, get into it, making this uh, delightful new composition. Always name them something. Um, and actually, 
you know we were talking about squares let's work in uh, let's work with squares today let's make this a square so we can enjoy uh, as they say it's hip to be square it's, someone will sing a few bars of that for us but as we create uh, our first our scene here we're probably going to want to start with a new solid for the sand in the background so we will go uh, with a nice sandy color um, hopefully not a horribly polluted sandy color <laughs> but there we go that's sandish and next thing we want to do is make these waves let's make the first wave and then we'll base the second wave off of that to save ourselves some time so we will go uh, and make a circle up here the method I like is double clicking on here hitting UU to bring up all the properties that were altered about that thing and then just tweaking it to taste so uh, maybe a 100 by 100 circle so we're defining at this point the width of each of those waves. Okay. So what is the what is the point to point, the crest to crest uh, of these waves? And 100 is probably good, um, given the size of our frame and uh, overall things. So since we've got this going on, uh, we're not going to link those properties back together. What I want this wave to do is to alter its size. So I'm going to just keyframe that here, and then I'm going to go ahead to the one second mark. And uh, at this point, it should be squished down to zero. So it's going to start full, go away. I'm going to go ahead two seconds. It's going to expand back up. So it's squish, and then it's going to mm, come back. Okay. And then what we'll do is we'll give a little character to this motion here, hitting F9, having it. It's easing. Easing. Easy, easy. So when we ease keyframes, if you look in the graph editor, you can get a better idea of what's actually happening. Hmm. In this case, we're looking at the values of these things. Uh, we could instead look at, so this is the speed. If we look at the value, oh, yeah. it looks like this, which is, this is a little bit more, um, which you're probably familiar seeing with easy ease things, mm -hmm. that um, as it comes in, it's having a bit more influence on it. And that's just because we want it to kind of slow at those points and then it expands back out. Um, so this is one wave. We need a bunch of waves. It's important to just one alone. It's not very beachy. So what I'll use is I will add a repeater. We had a question about the repeater earlier yep. in the feed I saw. Um, so in general, the repeater, when you put it into a group, so if we twirl down into everything that's in this layer, in this wave layer, we twirl down into that, we are confronted with contents and the transformation of the layer in general. Within the contents, we have this group we made, which is the ellipse. We go further down into that, we have uh, the ellipse path itself, which we have put keyframes on. We have a stroke, which we won't be using, so I'll delete it. We have a fill, which is defining what color you want to put inside that path. And then we have the repeater at the bottom. The hierarchy of shape layers, which we talked about a bit yesterday is that we start at the top and we work our way down. So it is a path, the path is filled, and then all of that is repeated. So the repeater works on everything above it by saying, you know, we are going to make how many copies? Well, let's make uh, just a modest number, maybe 10 will do it. And then we're going to offset those copies so that one of them is stuck in the middle. So mm. the copies are. How many of these are you gonna make? So we could, I mean, we could even make 20 of them maybe. And then we offset those so that, you know, if we offset it by ni negative 19, we've moved so that the, they're all going in the opposite direction. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. So we're gonna go, you know, negative 10 so that this is kind of in the middle. And so now all of them are doing the same thing because it's repeating everything above it. Um, and Which by the way, so the winner of yeah. uh, the contest with 80% of the votes is uh, the kid and the tree. Good. So congratulations. And uh, yeah, so you, we invite you if you want to create uh, short animations like this, just share them on Twitter at the Adobe Live hashtag and you will get a chance to win Creative Cloud. So. Mm -hmm. Which is terrific. So it pays to, to do work today. It's definitely <laughs> going to be good. 
So we've got this thing uh, expanding, contracting. Uh, we would also like to now add to this, we're going to add a rectangle. We don't want the rectangle to be repeated. Rectangle doesn't, we don't need a million rectangles. So we're going to put the rectangle path under the repeater. Now since we've done that, the rectangle is now also below the fill. So let's get that fill below the rectangle. So within this same group, we have, we've got the ellipse path, we've got a repeater repeating that path, we've got an unrepeated rectangle and all of it is filled. Hmm. So when you read your, your layer from top to bottom, that's what it's telling you. Uh, a lot of the questions I get about shape layers are confusion over this hierarchy hmm. and it's not something that is visually apparent, we'll say that. In Illustrator, you know, you're working with vectors but everything is right in front of you right away. Here, you're sort of doing a little bit of stuff behind the scenes and understanding what's happening back there will help you leverage these a lot better. Um, so we need to alter this rectangle I think. Um, the rectangle should be much much bigger um, so it could, be, it could be 1080 big maybe or even larger but we're also going to bring it down, bring down its position so that I mean if it's at 1500 then we want this to be at 1500 divided by 2 so it's stuck in the middle and so this is going <laughs> like this. So that's that's kind of a wave, right? Except right. it's not doing the second half of the wave thing, right? Like when it goes back, you mean? Yeah, it needs to it needs to cut Co away, right? Yeah. So what that means is that it's going to go from up to down and then it's going to cut into itself. So in order to do that, we have another set of tools that we can uh, work with we have the merge paths tools. So what I'd actually like to do is have this start uh, not at being fully up. Let's start it at being a line because this will make things uh, make marginally more sense for us. So let's just duplicate, copy this keyframe, paste it here. So it starts as a line, gets big, comes back to the line, okay. and then gets big again. Once this comes back to the line, I think the job of these circles is done. I don't think we need these specific circles to do too much for us because these we're going to call these the positive circles let's, <laughs> let's do that okay so what we can do with uh, with its keyframes we can just turn this into a hold keyframe and then not worry about it but before we do let's uh, let's duplicate um, this specific thing but let's duplicate these two uh, yeah. sort of together because if we're going to make different circles we want those repeated also so just duplicate those and we can put them in groups. So we can add a group and we can call this the positive positive circles. And so we really want to keep these things really organized. Okay. Add a different group, call this the negative circles colon sad face, just so we can <laughs> uh, keep all these things together. So inside the positive circles, we've got the ellipse path, we've got the repeater. So we want ellipse path two and the repeater in the negative circles. So we can still observe, things are still working out, we haven't broken anything yet. Um, but in the positive circles, we look here at the ellipse path, once it reaches this point here, no more thanks. So we're going to go toggle hold keyframe and then we can uh, remove that. So okay. it's going to go down and stay there. It's frozen. Okay. And a hold, a hold keyframe is basically saying stay where you are I'll come let you know information later. So it's going to mm -hmm. remain at that for a while. The negative circles, though, negative circles have a different relationship um, that we're going to be uh, working with. And that relationship is, is the idea that uh, it's expanding also, but we don't want it to be expanding uh, here in this space. So uh, its journey will go from being uh, go from being flat here yeah, to getting larger here okay. and then coming back down. Okay. And the next thing we're going to do is make them, uh, make them subtract from things. So the negative circles need to be subtracted from the rectangle path. So let's get the positive circles out of the way. Let's put, it, let's put that all the way down to the bottom so that these things don't mess with each other. Mm -hmm. We'll have the negative circles. We will now add a merge paths and the merge paths, we're going to say subtract, please. So, so it's, when when you do that, uh, it will subtract. 
So the shapes just to the the next layer. So the layer which is above all the layers. So what we're going to do is uh, we've got it in the we have it in the wrong hierarchy. You can see so it's within the negative circles. We don't want it in there. We need it to be outside there because what it's going to do. We have to switch these things. I think so. What we're saying. Whoop, there we go. What we're saying when we look at this hierarchy of things is rectangle path one, okay, and then negative circles, and then merge them together. Please subtract this oh. from this, right? So we could instead, we could say add. Please add this to this. We could say where do they intersect? Where does this intersect with this? Which is confusing it for, uh, for terrible... Uh, problems. We could go exclude intersections to make this, but we're saying subtract. We're saying rectangle path one, subtract negative circles equals this. Hmm. Now, positive circles is still hanging out because positive circles is below all of that stuff. So all of that stuff has happened, and then we arrive at positive circles, and then we decide to throw a fill into it, and then we're done. So you can see it's now going we woo <laughs> just like that so we've got that waving the waving is happening we're doing it it's working out um, one thing we want it to do though is constantly do this so we want this to, to loop to loop we gotta loop it and in order to do that we will use an expression so don't be afraid guys we're gonna do expressions but we're here to coach you through it um, so we are gonna hold down alt click on a stopwatch and we're going to type in L O O P, lowercase, capital O U T, and then you're going to put some brackets. Uh, so, what we're saying is please loop until the end of time, basically, until you run out of layer or you run out of comp. Um, loop out. And we have to say, how should you loop? There are four methods. And they're in quotes because we are putting in a string, and that string is uh, going to basically uh, it's going to basically explain you know which of the functions you want to choose. Mm -hmm. So sometimes in the brackets you put a number. In this case, we're putting a word, and the word is cycle. Uh, and what it's going to do is it's going to repeat what keyframes you have. So we need a couple more to kind of fill this out. Um, we need a keyframe here at the beginning uh, just because we want it to repeat the entire sequence of it because we have this that will also be repeating at the same time. So that also means I want a keyframe at the end of this one mm. because uh, it's important that these things are both looping and that their cycles match each other. I see. So if we looped it a different way, I'm just copying and pasting here, um, and that is that is loop out and then cycle in quotation marks within the brackets. Um, so what's going to happen is we are going to run through it all the way. So it's it's going to loop all of these keyframes again and again. If we didn't have this one at the beginning, let's we'll delete that, and we'll see how things kind of get a little, little crazy coming up. Works. Next. Well, it's still, still, still kind of working, right? But the, you want to have fine control of this stuff because it's just going to keep doing this all the time. Okay. What is actually happening is, is that this is coming up over top of while this one is still there because we're cutting a hole and you can't see it. I see. But just be aware that it's looping all the keyframes and only those keyframes. Um, something else we can do here, since we've got this looping, we've got this going whoosh woo during uh, at the speed we want. Then we can select all these and we can just squish them. I'm holding down the Alt and just squishing them down mm. like this. That's a fun little thing people are going to yes. like to do um, to quickly retime. Squish, squish. Uh, something else I want to talk about real quick here is this line here, this Ooh. horrible little intersection. Little, yeah, it was, what are you doing there, line? <laughs> Get your head in the game. Yeah. So what's happening is we're getting a bit of a tear, and that is because we're anti-aliasing this stuff, and we really need to say, uh, we need to help the help After Effects out to decide, because it's not displaying the full color. You know, it's uh, yeah, the pixels on the like line, 50 right? Fifty percent. Yeah. Opacity. And that's yeah. because we're just we're just slightly on the line. 
So if we start to move this layer around, that might change a little bit. But let's let's make life easier. Let's go into the uh, the rectangle here. Do, 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 do. I think it's the rectangle. That so is it because it's not like I would say pixel perfect? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So even if we move that, you're still getting a little bit of a problem because it is negative circles. So it's actually the circles themselves that are causing these woes. What you can do if you ever have this little problem and you've uh, thankfully gone through and you've set up uh, groups, you can go into the group and you can give this thing uh, an opacity of like zero and then that should get rid of wherever they all are. So we have to track down what is causing the specific problems. Do, do, do. Let's go back to the old beach waves here and see which were these. Yeah, it, was the, it was the positive circle after all. Hmm. Okay, so do, 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 do. if I want to get rid of it. Oh, yeah, because yeah. it's on the second. Exactly. Place. So it's so showing. You should up. hide the, yeah. the positive one. So if we go to these positive circles, they should go away when we do this. They should, anyway. Ooh, boy. Maybe we're in more trouble than I thought. Either way, what we're going to end up doing is rotating this negative 45 degrees to create this kind of thing. We may come back and clean that up at the end, but we're running low on time. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got this wave. The wave is going whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. That's perfect. We now need to imbue this with some movement, right? And the movement of this thing is going to be that it should move forward uh, uh, at the at the pushing and then it should retreat uh, as it is being pulled back so you might need to adjust your timing depending on you know how mm -hmm. you want that to happen uh, I think for our illustrative purposes this should work out so things are going to surge forward uh, meaning we're going to call up the position and make a little surge happen here that this should be forward so let's say it starts uh, at rest here to surge forward. It's going up and over like this. Surge, and then it will retreat. And eventually it will come to rest back where it was. Oh, yeah. Surge, retreat, kind of like that. Uh, depending on. <sighs> Goes. And then it comes back. You can start to tweak these things, though, mm -hmm. to have them ease into it. Oh, that's so relaxing. <laughs> you can just see. Ah, uh, nice. So we're setting up one type of motion for this wave. So let's give it a nice wavy, a wavy color. <laughs> Good. So we've got a bright one, and we also want to have a darker one. So we can duplicate this one, make this the darker one. And because they have the same timing, but we want to show that they're unique and different, we can just push this a little bit, mm -hmm. like so, so that they start from the same place, and then they resolve, and then they come back. So they're resolving. And you need to loop this as well. So if this is going to be a loop, you got to apply that loop out to here. Boop, 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 boop. We are going to loop yeah, out. Loop. Cycle. Just like that. Oh boy, we've done a bad thing. What is it saying? What's the error? Did I spell it wrong? Loop out. Cy a loo out. Oh, yeah. a loo out. Loo out. Yeah, it's uh, something it's, else. It's a loo out. It's just in the UK. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Go to the loo. Oh, <laughs> Yes, <laughs> the outside loo. The outside so now you, loo. now you can see it is whoosh, oh, nice. whooshing like that. So uh, if these things are confusing, we do have. We're probably going to try to put the project files up. Those are saved locally here. Oh, cool! Yeah. So we'll we'll try our best to do that. So, but yeah, okay. when we share the projects, uh, uh, we will um, update the description of the YouTube video, and we just add a link so mm -hmm. you can download the project file. Yeah. If we if we look back into the beach waves here. Um, they use a little bit of a different motion as they kind of catch up with each other. <laughs> so rather than having them end at a state of rest that are independent from each other, what you could do is you could have them end at the same spot 
and alter, the only thing you need to alter about them is this graph. Okay. So let's say instead of like this, we extend, uh, we, here we go, we'll just ease the two ends of this, mm -hmm. and that'll put a little gap in it as the two graphs, two graphs diverge from each mm -hmm. other. Nice. So this is what we talk about when we're saying how one thing is in motion relative to another thing's motion. These two start in the same place, they end in the same place, but their journeys to get there are very different. They are this much different here on the graph. And that difference tells us something about how they move in relation to each other. And it tells us a little bit about the depth, or in this case, this sea foam kind of thing going on. So that's something else to think about when you're thinking about how am I going to show depth with my work? How am I going to show that these two solids that are just colors, how, how do they have life? How do they have something mm. interesting happening with them? So that is, that is the gist of it, that you want to alter these two graphs to be a little bit different from each other. Because um, you could even make them, you could make them even more vastly different by grabbing these things and go and make sure you're on the speed graph. You got these two bubbles. Like if we have them, the top one even going, so the top one is kind of over racing the other one. So let me just go like this, switch it up. Now it's a totally different type of ocean. So it could be like this, where one is kind of beating the other one to where it wants to go. Uh, and it'll create, it creates totally different types of waves in this case. If we're talking about, you know, the sea is angry, how do you show that with the graph uh, or those kinds of things. So you can imbue your project with life in those ways. Um, and now I'll drink some water because it's time to, time to do some character animation while we still have time. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Mm -hmm. I can't show a cool dude with a funny hat and not talk about how to actually make him. So <laughs> that would be a huge tease. So we're going to use the techniques that we covered in those other two videos to make this guy look from side to side. He's a very cute, very interesting looking fella. He has a very chibi looking face and mouth. Um, and you can put these faces uh, onto just about anything. Um, and, you know, maybe you put it onto a bundle of grapes because you're the Fruit of the Loom company. Maybe you put it onto, uh, I don't know, maybe you put it onto like a carburetor because you're a carburetor company. I don't know. The point is, th this is a very simple kind of thing to adapt to many different situations. Uh, it's also a very popular way to just like a little cutesy dude. So there are a lot more layers going on on this guy than there were in the other examples. But don't be too intimidated because we're using the same ideas. We're just doing doing it more. So to start off, we should create a new composition. Sure, we can work in that square again. Uh, so let's call this Hat Boy 2. Um, the Hat Boy's body was just a circle. So. We make a circle. Doesn't need to be that big, but it can be perhaps of this size. And the circle, his body, moved from side to side because he was looking from side to side, right? Um, and so we want to convey that subtle amount of detail. We could have him go nowhere, right? If we go, well, let's go back to Hat Kid and have his body go nowhere. Instead of subtly going from side to side, we could strip that out. It's lost a little bit. It's not all gone, but having these things in here, having these little little bits, is what really makes them. When you add them all together, that's what really makes it seem like it's alive, like there's something interesting happening. So, without further ado, we want to make this thing move around, and we want to sort of plan in this animation what is the rest state. When is you know the far extreme on one end? When is the far extreme on the other? And then we return to the rest state. So in this case, we are going to use this thing's position. And so it's going to start here. And then at one second, he's looking a little bit in this direction. And then at three seconds, looking a little bit in that direction. And then at four seconds, he returns to rest. Yeah, that's really good. It's just looking over there, he's looking over there. Nothing's looking anywhere yet. 
he needs a face. So this is going to be the body. Now we are going to get the face. Same thing. It's just going to be another circle. So why don't we duplicate this one? And we're going to fill it in um, with uh, uh, yeah, we'll do zero here and pretty high. I don't need to go all the way. So this is this is doing the exact same thing yeah. as the body, right? What we can do is we can take this. We are going to hit UU, bring the size down a little bit. So we have this border between the face definition and the body definition. And it is going to go a little bit a little bit more in that direction. And it's going to go a little bit more in that mm -hmm. direction. So already. Yeah. Just to yeah. As you said, just to give the illusion of depth. No. That's right. And I mean, if you were making, if you were making like an and eyeball, with the colors, as you say, like yeah, the bright ones, foreground highlight. Yeah, yep, the bright that's ones it. are close. The dark ones are far away. And we could, you could use this technique if you want to make like an eyeball that's looking around. That's the <laughs> same idea. That you know, it's got this middle, it's got this outside, and you're playing around between the relationship between those. Uh, something else you'll probably want to do is ease these keyframes, just because eased keyframes are more playful, the more interesting, and Something else to consider, though, is the motion between here and here is accelerating, decelerating, and now it's coming back and it's accelerating through the rest mm. state right here in the middle. So just keep that in mind as we as we go on, because that will present challenges as we sort of refine the motion throughout here. Okay. So it's got uh, he's looking over here. Well, if it's a character that needs to have eyes, humans love looking at eyes. It's their <laughs> favorite thing. Um, in the news industry, they say eyes and teeth. That's what people resonate with and like seeing those things. So labeling things accordingly. Let's make some eyes. And, you know, eyes are just circles. You know, it's just windows into your soul in the shape of a circle. And so we are going to make a couple of those. Again, double-clicking, making the circle, and then we are unlinking things, or we are linking them and making them small. Um, let's get this guy real big eyes. Um, what I like to do on these things is try to think of things in proportion to each other. Like, what is the gap between here? Maybe make the eye relative to that. If you're drawing this thing and you're using a grid and stuff like that, and you can keep everything in nice proportions to each other, okay. that's definitely something to work with. Because um, this is 400 large, this is 500 large. So if I make this 100 large, it'll kind of things kind of work out. We've expected ratios that we want to sort of see in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so something to to kind of keep in mind. So 100 or 50 or something in that yeah. space. So where should the eye be? Well, it should be left and right of center, right? So we're going to need two of them. And something that I like to do when dealing with these things, we can animate both of their positions separately. But I would really like if I didn't have to do so much work, so I'm going to create a null object here. And this one is going to be the eye control. And both of these eyes will now be parented to that null, and the null will move back and forth. Yes. So Angelo is asking, could you link the, mo the motion onto a point so we can control the head just by moving an adjustment node? You can do that, absolutely. Okay. It is going to require some math. Um, oh, okay. So, because... So it's not just uh, keyframes in this case? You because of all of the little subtle things that we're putting in here, let's imagine that we had... Let's put in two, uh, two nulls. As these two nulls move apart from each other, that is, we would say, like, we'd be setting up a relationship to say, all right, this null is in the center, this null is over here, and between those should be an arrangement of all the other things, right? Oh yeah. So imagine um, you have like a like a stack of, of um, CDs or you mm -hmm. know things, and you you slide the top one, and all the other ones should slide with it, but they should all slide with it not in a linear fashion. The ones that are closest to you will slide differently than the ones that are further away. If this person is a sphere, if this character is a sphere, mm -hmm. then you have a very different relationship between what's on the top of the sphere and as you rotate it around. So 
those relationships require a careful amount of math, of ratios, of multiplying. Um, if that's a project that you're kind of into, that you would you feel like you get a lot of mileage out of, absolutely do that. One caveat I will say though is in a practical application of doing this, if I'm making one GIF with this one character, okay. Well, it's done. I'm throw it away, right? And maybe I'll come back to it later. Maybe I'll reuse the math that I worked up later. <laughs> but for this one project, you're done. You know, you've spent all this time creating all these dynamic linkages to yeah. save you so much time. Eventually, there's a diminishing return on how much time you've actually saved. So it's more um, like return on investment in right. this case. That's right. Now, if you're creating, maybe you're making a template for somebody else. Maybe you're, you know, you're working on a team and someone else is going to do the animation. You're just setting it up and you're rigging it. Then it's definitely something to look into. Uh, um, happy in Japan is uh, yeah. Sorry, so we refresh oh, this. Well. I'm, I'm checking here. Kay. So what's the shortcut you hold down when dragging objects to make them stick to the boundaries of other objects? Oh, so that's uh, snapping. Ah. I'm calling it snapping. Uh, so if I want something to stick to the boundary of another object, holding down the command. Command on the Mac. Yeah, and then up. And oh, okay, and then you see the boundaries of other. Objects. Yeah. So what's going on here when we use and this is kind of a new feature, not if you're not using sort of the when did snapping come out? CS six maybe? If you're on a on a much older version, this is not a feature for you. Oh, okay, so but and the snapping has been improved in later CC, versions, I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just because you can also snap to like oh, yeah. the vertices of paths, which is all super great, uh, especially for our purposes. So for example, if my mouse is closer to the center when I begin this, when I'm when I start doing the uh, when I start, if I'm dragging and my mouse is near the center, I'm holding this down. See, it puts this little square. Yeah. That's saying that's the point of reference that you're going to be snapping to. Okay. And look, it snaps to the edge of this circle. How oh, yeah. how wonderful is wow, this? Nice. That's great. That's the best. Um, nice. It, so it, that it, so thanks for the shortcuts. It's yeah. command. Yeah. Yeah. And. If I'm close to this square over here and I hold down, that's what's going to snap. So just keep that in mind when you're when you're snapping to stuff. Uh, if it's not doing as you expect, you just might not be clicking in the right spot. Or your version of After Effects may be way too old. This, this was for you, happy in Japan. And also, Thiago Machado is uh, asking, like, could, could we use a repeater for the eye? You could, but we are going to animate each eye separately. So. Oh, so it because won't be exactly the same. Because uh, if we look at the example of Hat yeah. Kid here, this eye gets larger because as your head moves. Oh, you play with the scale. Because your that side of your head is now closer, <laughs> right? And the other eye is further okay. away. So if it was a repeater, each would be related to the other, um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. But it doesn't give us independent control. And when you use a repeater, it isn't making a new object. That. The objects you see that are repeated don't exist. They're magical, they're uh, ephemeral. They uh, they don't have position and scale except as related through the repeater from something else. So um, think of it like a prism that is just casting these uh, instances out into the world. Uh, you can alter the prism. You can alter the original. You can't alter the individuals it has created. Good. Chago, uh, say thanks. You are so. welcome. <laughs> That's that's what live interactions yeah, that's all about. Yeah, so that's <laughs> Feel free to ask questions. So. Yeah, then we then we get into these things. So, we've got these two eyes. We're we're parenting them to this null object, and the eyes we just need to shift them to the sides, just poking them minus a hundred, positive a hundred like this, and then the eye control its position should be changing as well, so that the eyes are kind of following along with what we're doing. So we call up all the frames that we're, we're doing so far. So the eyes should move this way a little bit. And then they should move back this way a little bit. And then they will come to rest where they started. So we'll go copying and pasting. And so like we talked about, you want to make sure all the motion is the same. So you notice these are linear. These are not linear. F9. F9. Ease them. Ease these things. Okay. Already, he's looking places, right? And we <laughs> get the idea that the eyes are the closest thing to us right now. If we want to kind of make this uh, make this work a little bit better for us, then what we can be doing is we call up the position of these eyes, 
which is described, as we talked about with parenting, relative to the null. So that's why these say minus 100 and 100, because they are relative to this one. So at rest, you know, we've, we've got these two uh, situations going on. Uh, and we talked about also increasing the scale of these things in an unlinked way, because they, they, these objects, they might scale up uh, uniformly, if that's what the eye does, if that's the shape that the thing is. But you can start to tell things about the shape of things by how they react when you turn them. Yeah. You don't know a sphere is a sphere until you turn it, and then you observe how it goes. You don't know a circle is a cylinder until you turn it. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we are going to be turning it. Um, and what I also want to happen is I kind of want the eyes to get a little bit closer together as they sort of move on this journey. Mm -hmm. So the eyes are squishing a little bit maybe. You know, they don't have to squish too much, but they should come together a little bit um, just because that's that's kind of what we expect them to do. If they remain yeah. the same distance apart, it's kind of like how yeah, a shark right. is. Um, but now they're going to remain. Yes, we're all turning our heads. You know, that's right. At home. <laughs> Everyone at home is yeah. also. Yeah, that is how Check my. Check the face in the mirror. <laughs> that is how my yeah. eyes go. Um, so we talked about uh, this sort of state of rest that mm. these things are in. Um, so at this point. <laughs> there we go. So. We talked about how the middle of between these two keyframes is the state of rest again, meaning that these eye positions need to return to how they were in the beginning, right? Because they need to start here, then they get pinched together, then they expand, and then they come back. But the graph isn't quite accurate where we're at. This is possibly true. All of these should be eased. So if we look at sort of the motion of all of the stuff, the motion here is, is like this. But the motion of the position is like this. Very different graphs. Yeah. So what we want to do is we want to use that type of keyframe here, the continuous Bezier through time, by uh, holding down the command. And then we're going to go to linear, and then we go to continuous Bezier. Now what this is doing is we go back into the graph. Now it looks like this. Ooh, okay. Very different. It still has the acceleration here, yeah. so it's still very speedy all the way through because that should be a time of, oh, of fast okay. motion. So if this is different, if it's like that, that comes to rest, and then you really, it really starts to throw you off a little bit when this happens. So these are the little things that you want to pay very close attention to is, you know, is this working as I expect it naturally? If not, why not? So those are the things that we're trying to resolve today. And yes, Mario Arts and Max Mayer, we know we're, you're in the chat. <laughs> Very happy to have you. Don't worry. <laughs> we see, uh, we yeah. see everybody. It's just we have a small chat window this morning because the big one just froze. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we will fix it. That's why we've got you man in the boards over yeah, here. Yeah, that's so. why I'm here. <laughs> but we, we know you're there. Perfect. And thanks you all for joining. Mm. Um, if you like what you're showing, uh, what you're what you're watching, remember to yep. like it on YouTube. Too. And also, it will help. Definitely subscribe to this channel because yeah, because for the rest of the day yeah, and tomorrow, there'll be and more guests, way more in the future. So, okay. we will have uh, Chris Trini joining in 40 minutes. We have uh, yeah. Vincent. Yeah, who do you some 3D today? Oh boy. Yeah. So we're doing effects. we're doing fake 3D. He's gonna do real 3D. Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> so we're talking about these eyes. We also want to scale the eyes up and down a little bit because as things move away from us around the curvature of this face, they need to get smaller. So one of the eyes is gonna scale down a little bit. In fact, it's gonna it's gonna narrow itself as it goes. I, and um, Monk Jun Han is asking how to type uh, change the type of keyframes again. So you're mm. pressing Command. Yep. And you click on the keyframe, right? That's right. Okay. So that's one way of doing it. There are a bunch of shortcuts. For example, F9 is to easy ease, ease them. Yeah. Now, 
while we're on the subject of changing uh, keyframes, you can also select a keyframe, right click on it, and go to keyframe interpolation. Interpolation is a fancy word to say how are we getting from one keyframe to the other. And when you select keyframe interpolation, you get to choose its temporal or mm -hmm. temporal uh, interpolation. And you get to choose its spatial interpolation and whether it is its roving kind of properties. Oh, okay. um, so this is some real deep keyframe yeah. action going on here. Um, which we'll probably talk about tomorrow a little bit more. Okay. Because now is now is not the time. For now, yes. Uh, Evan will be back tomorrow. Let me put the schedule in the chat. <laughs> but for today, it's enough that we know how to ease them and how to get this continuous Bezier middle ground uh, in there. So, what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, this eye kind of shrink a little bit, uh, and so it'll start at 100, 100, and again, it's going to be easy eased like that. The other eye though, we're going to have that get bigger. So it's going to start in the same situation, but it's going to get bigger. It's going to go... Oh yeah. Change the scale. And as you are working on the scale, Michel is asking if uh, you always draw everything in After Effects or sometimes you go to Illustrator and bring mm. some graphics. So this is one of those things where it really depends. Uh, it depends on the complexity of what you're drawing. It depends on um, how much of it you're actually going to animate is something else. So if you're fine to animate legs, arms, head, that kind of thing, if that's the level of detail that you're working at, maybe Illustrator is great for that. Because mm. um, you can draw very complex, very wonderful looking artwork in Illustrator. Then you can break it up into its component layers, all the parts that you're going to change over time. Uh, and then you can bring all of those into After Effects. And you can work with them. You can convert a lot of those into shapes and play around with them at that point. So if your drawing is highly complicated, or I want to say just because you have so many more options more to... More tools. Yeah, more tools. To draw. Yeah. And it's... Because that is its... That's its function. It's designed for. And not that shape layers aren't designed for that also, but it's just not as optimized for that kind of experience. Because you can do so many wonderful things in Illustrator. Um, anyway, so what we've also uh, done here is I'm just going to bump the eyes a little bit in each direction. So we've got it, this one's kind of like getting larger as it gets closer to us. Okay. It's going to return to the rest state like we talked about before. Okay, so you could be paste the Cop scale yep. frame. Get that. We know it's going to return to the rest yeah. state at the end, so let's make that happen. And now it's going to have the inverse relationship that it had here. So, you know, this one is going to be larger now. Do -do. Mm -hmm. And uh, Happy in Japan is asking, where do you look for inspiration? So I actually spent a lot of time uh, looking at Vimeo. is a great okay. place. There are a lot of very active communities on there. Uh, people sharing their reels, people sharing the projects they do. Um, it's, it's interesting because uh, we're starting to see uh, a lot more vines, a lot more Twitter uh, activity yeah. of, like we said, those square things. People are loving the looping GIFs. Um, you just kind of have to you have to keep your eyes open for these things. So definitely check out uh, Vimeo. Just they categorize things into animation and motion graphics. Just have a peruse, and their editorial staff uh, curate things over there. So you can you can check that out. But somewhere else is pretty good. It's an Adobe place called uh, is it Behance? Behance? Yeah. yeah. Check that There's out. There's also a motion graphics category, and mm -hmm. a lot of people. A lot of people in this field are very proud of their work, so they like yeah. to share it, and they should be because it's beautiful. And so, and Behance is also to make connections, like to yeah, like to curate uh, a network, and uh, you can directly engage with a motion designer in New York, for instance. Yeah. So if you see people's work that you like, you reach out to them. If you, yep. if you see people you collaborate with, reach out to them on there. Uh, it's it's terrific to have have these communities that push them push each other to to do better. So. We've got these eyes working out. We've got that going now. Uh, and again, we talked about this motion. These things should be these continuous Beziers as well, because that acceleration needs to be happening yeah. throughout the thing. So we've got the eyes going. The The next thing we want to do is get a mouth in there, I think. So let's, uh, let's do that. And uh, the mouth was, I really just drew it, because uh, why, why not? We got, uh, so I like to show the grid. I like to snap to the grid, um, and this grid is very helpful when you are drawing because it makes things a little bit easier 
to get them exactly. So hmm. with things snap into this grid, you can see we can make very quickly. <laughs> Zveri is having a great time, this dude. <laughs> so maybe, uh, maybe a mouth of this size. Tough to say how big the mouth should be, but I think that's working out. Uh, and this mouth, I'm going to hit UU to call up uh, its uber frame. We would like a stroke on it, and we don't want to fill on it. So no fills, thanks. Yes, strokes, thanks. And let's do a, let's do a fill strokes. Strokes the same color as the eyes. And we'll uh, do it up like this. Well, actually, I'm selecting the points, and I'm scaling the points down rather than scaling the layer down. Um, there we go. Nice, cute, very chibi mouth. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, and Angelo wants you to add an expression like a blink. You know, like oh, we could do, we could do yeah, blinking. We could do that. Um, and Aaron is asking uh, why use the continuous basic reframe? Isn't it similar to the linear keyframe like in the graph? Uh, yes and no. Yes and no. It is. So in this case, no. I mean, when yeah, you were showing <laughs> the, gra the graph, it was not. Yeah. Not so the I'll just change the stroke there. Have a round cap, and now we can we can go back <laughs> to these. So. Check out the graph. Woo! Things are looking fun here, right? So this button here is to convert them to auto Bezier. This will convert it to linear. We convert it to linear. We convert it to auto. Convert it to linear. Convert it to auto. Okay. We can do that again. Convert it to linear. <laughs> so what's happening is with linear, it's saying the speed you come in at, that's the speed you leave at. Linear. Mm. Like line. Auto and continuous Bezier and these things are looking at a bit of a fuller picture. It's saying, here's the expected curve coming in. Take that expected curve going out. Not, okay, last second you were traveling at you know 35 miles an hour. Please continue doing that. It's sort of saying, all right, you decelerated coming into the turn, so we're going to repeat that coming out the other side. Mm. Um, for all those F1 fans out there. Um, F1. <laughs> F1. Formula 1. That's right. Um, so they are, they are different, and... Um, Knowing the difference between them can save you a lot of trouble down the road. Linear uh, keyframes also don't have handles to mess around with. So, uh, if you want, if you want some handles on there, that's how you're going to get them. Um, so we've got a mouth. The mouth can actually be stuck on the eye control as well, because it should probably be somehow in alignment with them. But you can see, because of how much work we've been doing with the eyes, that the mouth looks kind of funny when it's not. Oh yeah, because it, there was no. Yeah, it's it's not, or, yeah. it's not squishing. It's not. Yeah, what's not, happening? <laughs> You're making so much more work. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got the we got the path, we got the shape, we got its. So stuff. in this case, you cannot scale. I mean, it's not scaling I in can, this case. I can scale whenever I want to. I know. I'm in full command of this machine. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, you want to scale the mouse like when it's in the center? That's right. So oh, what okay. so what I can do is, I've got the path, I've got the stroke. I could just hit scale and do the scale of the layer, right? Now, if I did that, what's going to happen is. This starts to get squished, and you can see how the um, oh, yeah. these it's no longer a uniform yeah. stroke. Um, I want that stroke to be uniform. I, I think that's a nice that's a nice look. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to go into the shape, and I'm going to take the stroke and I'm going to pull it out of the shape, and then I'm going to put the shape above the stroke. So it looks like nothing has changed, but something big has changed. Okay. That I can now go into here and I can use scale. And the stroke is going to remain exactly the same because it's independent of, oh, okay, of okay, the okay. scaling. So when we say the hierarchy is important, this is what we mean, that we can change things so fundamentally by just altering the order that things are in. So now I get to use scale willy-nilly however I wish. So I can start to scale it down there, have it at 100 there. We'll repeat the process on this side. Copying, pasting, make sure you line them up. And on here, we are at that rest position again. Now, again, you got to look at these things, hit F9, ease them, and this one should be that continuous Bezier. So now it's kind of going nice. kind of like that. Now, the distance that this is from the center is going to tell us where their mouth is. Do they have a protruding mouth? Do they have a, you know, a, a mouth that's stuck in there? What is its relationship to the eyes? At this point, when it goes back and forth, it kind of seems like it's both in front of and behind the eyes, maybe. So it's kind of flexing around. So you could use position here, again, to describe what its relationship is, that its position during the rest states are all the same, but during these extreme states, 
maybe it's further out this way, maybe it's further back this way. So you have the option now to describe in you know motion detail what's going on with these things. So yeah, there we go. Nice little mouth. <laughs> um, Let's see how we're doing for time here. Uh, someone requested a wink. So yeah. That's when, what they want. when you're working with shapes, when you're working with uh, all these things, you'll notice that the eyes, we've used the layers, position, and scale on the eyes. Hmm. What I'd I could say it's a good one because Happy is Jap in Japan is uh, saying, uh, maybe we could just uh, build a 3D you know, ball and with a texture and then rotate. Mm, you could. But then, if so you want a wink, ah. <laughs> so you need to use uh, compositions and stuff like that. If we use a 3D ball and just map this, yeah. maybe we use the CC sphere. Uh, uh, and you look. map a comp. Mm -hmm. Yep, and you just stick the comp oh, on there. You, you could do it that way. Some interesting things start to happen hmm. that, again, we're talking about fine control, right? Yeah. If you want to surrender control to uh, the sphere to do these things, that's totally fine. If you want to put a null in the center and you want to have like these things arrayed around it, uh, like a kind of disco ball with these things hanging out in 3D space and move that back and forth. Totally good to do that too. Hmm. Um, one of the reasons I don't like to do that is we talked about collapse transformations just a little bit before. Hmm. If then I want to throw in other 3D elements and I want to scale this dude up and down and I want all the edges to be crisp and perfect, then I collapse the transformations and suddenly poof, I got parts coming out every which way just because as soon as you collapse those transformations to get those clean vector lines, you got that 3D stuff going on in the context of wherever that comp is. Um, so for me, I prefer to keep things two-dimensional as much as possible, except in the instances where I know 3D stuff is, we said this at the beginning, in the instances you know that 3D stuff is gonna be a big part of what you're doing, then that's the avenue you probably wanna go for. Um, another thing that gets a little bit interesting with 3D things is it becomes very aware you the audience will become very aware that it is a 2.5D dude that yeah. these are little little discs hmm. um, it's not a bad thing that's an interesting look explore that um, in this way we are able to just have them we can manipulate them as much as we want we're not also then trying to work around things being in 3D. Um, so that's, kind of, that's kind of the idea uh, behind that. Uh, but to do a wink, there are a few ways we could do it. We can alter things directly inside this shape layer. Um, I think the wink should happen when they come flush on. So what we can do is with this eye, we can go into the contents. We can mess around with the contents in here by adding a rectangle and then we can add a merge paths and the merge paths will be subtracting meaning ellipse path minus rectangle path equals this and then we will just put this up like so oh, nice. and then we will go keyframe the position one two wink Whoa. and then one two three return and then we will of course gotta easy ease these so it comes to rest wink and that's it. Now if you want to maybe a more pronounced wink, you could stretch these out by selecting them, holding Alt, pulling them, wink, wink. So this is a very flirtatious circle. I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> my, own, my own creation is making me uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, so that's how you could put little things in there. Now, that's nice. let's say you want to get really complex with your, your eyes. You could put in pupils, you could put all this kind of thing. You could put all of that inside the contents of your shape layers. Shape layers, a lot of people do just like 100 shape layers stacked on top of each other. Uh, I like to work inside the shape layer as much as possible um, just because it's got the same hierarchies that you could achieve. You could also pre-compose things. We could just take this and we could say, you know what, I, I love everything that you're doing. I'm going to pre-compose you and I'm going to move all the attributes to the new composition. Okay. I, could, I could do that if I want. Now what that's going to do is it's going to rip everything out of here and mm. throw it somewhere else. So might not be the best avenue. But something that's great about this is that you've got position and scale out here. If this was a composition and you start messing around inside the composition with winking with yeah. eyebrows and stuff, all of the scaling, all of this getting bigger, closer to the camera, getting smaller, all of that is preserved in this composition. So 
all of that information is still correct and valid. Say the producer comes back and says, uh, the eyes need to be more cat-like. I want to see more cats. G give me that meow face, and uh, you'll be able to edit that. So you're mm. setting yourself up for that uh, future success. Um, the last thing, one last thing, is this guy needs a hat. He needs a cool hat. And uh, you could give him any shape of hat you'd like. Um, the hat we used on this dude uh, is a little trucker style hat, um, which I do by going a little new. And we go new. No, no, no. We go up here, we grab the polygon. We make a polygon. We take the polygon and just alter it down to have uh, six sides, please. And just needs a fill, doesn't need a stroke on it. Um, and then that polygon, we're just going to shrink it down to be of the correct size for this guy's head. Doesn't need a stroke at all. Um, so its outer radius should be, hmm, let's see if we can get that to sort of match with his head. But it's not going to matter too much because I'm also going to convert it to a Bezier path. <laughs> so anytime you make circles, oh. anytime you make shapes, and you think, man, I wish I had manual control over more of those points. Right click on yeah, it. You can convert, convert to the path. Boom. Okay. We're actually going to parent this to the body by holding down shift. When you hold down shift and parent, you change the position to be at zero, zero, meaning you're putting the two anchor points on top of each other. So we've got this hat in the right space. I think that's, that's the spot. Uh, we're just going to move it up a little bit. We are going to grab its points, which we can do whenever we'd like, and we can just kind of move it up to have this kind of a look going on. We can now take the points and we can just convert them a little bit like this to give him a little bit of a rounded hat look. There we go. So you can, you can design yours however you wish, but uh, now he's got kind of like a, like a beanie going on. <laughs> We call them toques up in Canada. <laughs> so, yeah, let's let's go with uh, with an all black kind of hat. This is kind of a funny looking hat. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. So, this is the uh, cap sort of outline. Um, but what denotes that the cap is three dimensional? We had the color change, but the real big thing that I think really makes it happen is we just took a pen tool and we just drew a line across the front. And uh, that line, uh, we're snapping the stuff. We get that snap to grid off. Um, so we're going to use this line here to become sort of the brim of a hat. Okay. Do do? So it needs to have a fairly substantial stroke on it. So we go into the contents, shape one, turn that on, turn this off. This path needs to be fairly substantial. So let's, let's actually amp that up to like 50. And we want to kind of set it so that that path is resting so that the stroke is right on the line there. Okay. And that stroke, we're going to go a rounded cap. Wonderful. And we just want to kind of make sure that that path isn't jutting out beyond mm. the bounds when we don't want it to be. Make the color the same color as the hat because we're going to get a little sneaky. And <laughs> then we're going to keyframe that path in keeping with the sort of uh, things that we've got going on. So the path at here and here and here all the same time, but the path here is sticking out. So now you know it's a hat, right? And at here, it's a hat. And then we take these and then Fine. F9 and continuous busy. And now the hat is nice. turning. And so we can do this in 3D, I right? See a hat. If you if you want to do this in real 3D, you want to have a peak coming out the front of this guy. Oh, go yeah. nuts, right? Because or something like yeah, exactly. Curvy. We could curve this too. Like at rest, we could come and we could just take these points and we could curve them. You know. So you would add one point. Oh, uh, we could, or we could just you know do these two points. Oh, okay. You know, whichever whichever is good for your methods. Because uh, if we stick that point up like so. And then we just go like this. Uh, da, da, da. Now I'm going to want to sort of differentiate this by giving it a different color. Now we're just adding so many different colors. Uh, da, da, da. So you can kind of get an idea of that. You're also going to want to like curve that 
that part of the cap oh, yeah, yeah. in the back, I see what right? You mean. Um, so we're we're just adding so much more work for ourselves, but we're gonna copy that and paste it here. And also paste it here. Um, but things are gonna get more complicated with the geometry that we're trying to explain to people, right? Because it shouldn't flatten <laughs> out like that, right? What should actually happen is that this shape should go this way, right? And it should squish like this. Oh, nice that idea. is the expected geometry of nice. the front of the hat. And then you just need to build the rest and of it. And follow behind. everything. Yeah, because yeah. that would be a shape that just expands yeah. from the back. And in fact, you could, I mean, uh, this is sort of an instance where, because ah, then this side would be it's a different color. And there's so many things, but yeah, you, you could just duplicate. You need an extra shape. Yeah, you could duplicate this path, and you could just take this and go a little bit like this. And you just need to kind of connect these two oh, I see what together. Mean. So, because that's the whole geometry <laughs> of the hat, right? Nice. So when we say simplify, don't simulate. That's what we're doing. We could simulate, we could spend all day getting plugins that make a curved arc in 3D space and rotate that around a sphere. Or I can spend five minutes doing this. So that's, <laughs> yeah. you know. No, that's a, the thing. Yeah. Once you become kind of conversational with these kinds of techniques, everything starts to really fall into place for you. Um, you get the idea that, oh, okay, I want to add this geometry to it, so now I'm doing this. Oh, I want to add these this type of motion, so now I'm doing this. Um, but we'll be covering more of that tomorrow. Yeah. So Maybe you want to explain what you will cover tomorrow? Uh, not only can I explain it, I'll just show you a video ah, that we're doing tomorrow. Teaser. Right? That's right. It's, so uh, in case you hadn't noticed, I'm kind of a baseball fan. I like baseball hats. Um, I'm a Jays fan, but I'm in Giants territory today. So. Whoa. What we're going to be doing is combining the ideas that we talked about oh, nice. with rotation, faking rotation, faking 3D things, and we're going to be using what's called common geometry to go from one object to another object. In this case, we're using the curvature of a baseball to then turn into the elongated cylinder of a hot dog and putting a bun around it. Another thing that we're going to be doing a little bit simpler, if we have the time, is let's make this bigger. This guy is master of parallax. <laughs> so they say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so we'll also be doing something like this, where a phone turns into a credit card. This is sort of where the rubber hits the road for a lot of motion graphic designers. Someone comes to you, they give you a script, they give you some ideas, they say, uh, please make this noun into this noun, or one sentence is talking about fiduciary responsibility, please then link that to the next sentence where we're talking about Q4 growth. <laughs> please come up with a picture for each of those sentences and then go from one to the other. That's nice. the general thing that you I just said, uh, very excited, looking for <laughs> tomorrow, yes. <laughs> so yeah, please make sure to come back. And also, in, uh, in about 30 minutes, we will start a new stream with uh, Chris Trini, who uh, will continue explaining how to take your classic uh, footage and apply a cinematic look, yeah. working on color, uh, so directly in After yeah. Effects. Yeah, so as much as I don't use those things, he uses them beautifully, and it's going to be amazing. So if you want to expand your minds, then uh, link is in the description of this video, right? Yeah, and, uh, and uh, in the description of the video, we'll also put the link now directly in the, in the chat. Next stream in 30 minutes here. Awesome. After Thursday, I'm going to have so much practice. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> that's true. Practice, practice, practice. It's important. And we still have a few minutes, so we will do a giveaway. Yes. OK, so we will give away a uh, one year credit card subscription to uh, someone in the chat to enter uh, make sure to subscribe to uh, the Adobe Creative Cloud channel. Actually, it will give you more chances. And you need to uh, put a sentence in the chat with the keyword After Effects. OK? Uh, so make sure to uh, to say something about After Effects. Uh, you can also say something nice about Evan to uh, say, uh, thank you, Evan, for <laughs> teaching me After Effects. I don't know. <laughs> um, and, um, and if you like the video, also press the like button on YouTube. It will help. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, thanks for being with us. So yeah, so we had a very nice, very active crowd this morning. Thanks for all the questions. And also, uh, uh, they had also a lot of discussions oh, among, yeah. uh, among them. So it was great. Yeah. And um, OK, we start having some entries now. 
This is fitting the script. Yeah, and, and while the script is running, I just want to say thanks to everybody for coming out. Uh, it means a lot to see people coming out and learning. Uh, and yeah, tune in tomorrow for more excellent stuff right here. And uh, I've been Evan Abrams, and uh, you've been enjoying this. <laughs> okay. Thanks, you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> After Effects is magic, met democratic. Wow, <laughs> that's a that's a good tagline. Yeah, yeah. We will talk to the team. <laughs> yeah. It will appear on the website. Might so use that. Make sure to put a copyright. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Once you put it in the chat, it belongs to Adobe now. That's wait for it. Wait for it. The machine is working. Okay, and uh, yeah. So make sure to stay with us today. There will be more giveaways, and and you will learn so much today. So mm -hmm. good work with uh, Chris Trini on the. Cinematic look and focusing on color in After Effects. Uh, with uh, we will have Vincent and Guillen, uh, who will talk from um, Creative Dojo, who will talk about 3D designs and workflows with After Effects. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Mikey will be back to explain how to use dynamic effects uh, such as trails, bends, shadows, wobbles. Uh, so it should be awesome. And Sarah uh, will be back at the end of the day and she will edit her next episode of Creative Space, which is her YouTube uh, show, uh, live. So like, she will edit live, and uh, we will learn I mean, so much uh, tips and tricks from her. Yeah, get really to see uh, how the sausage gets made. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's great. And, and she, so we discovered yesterday that she had uh, custom uh, shortcuts. Mm. So she took all the, cust all the <laughs> shortcuts of Premiere, I mean, the one they need, and to put them on the left of the keyboard, Hmm. So she's editing using just a mouse and the key and the and the left hand. So yeah, that's terrific. It should be interesting to watch. Interesting. Actually, I will try to plug a GoPro uh, this afternoon to oh, see so how see, she yeah. uses the keyboard. Should, should be fun. Okay, we'll try to do that some high technology. <laughs> so do we have a, a winner? Yeah, and did you tell them that subscribing to Creative Cloud increases their chances? Yeah, they know. <laughs> they know All that right. if they are Creative Cloud subscribers. There you are. And oh, the winner is Johnny Lightning. Lightning. <laughs> no. <laughs> Johnny Lightning. Johnny okay, Lightning. congratulations, Johnny. We will uh, contact you. Um, so check your YouTube messages. Also, if you won yesterday, we will start uh, con uh, reaching you to uh, give you a one-year Creative Cloud uh, code. If you are already a Creative Cloud member, it will extend your membership. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you, Evan. Thank you. Uh, it was great. And. Um, we we'll see you tomorrow. Absolutely. Same time. Yep. And stay with us. Okay, we'll be back with Chris in about 10 minutes. <laughs> see you guys. Bye.